just crossing onto Ile des Sœurs from uh, Verdun. Sun's about to crack the horizon. Some seagulls flying. And one of the things I noticed crossing the Verdun shore over to Nuns Island here, I'm right above the channel in between, is <laughs> the trees on the Verdun side, which have obviously been removed and redone a million times because there's so much bridge construction here. But I'm reminded of Chuck's lecture about the, um, what do you call it? Uh, the succession, which trees come first. And you can just see like the, the way the trees have had to kind of build their way back. It's a totally different bunch of trees on that Verdun side than on the Ile des Sœurs side where there's still a little bit more of like, I'd say, kind of natural shore. Yet they're all kind of hanging on, hanging over the water's edge as the traffic plows by. Oh my goodness, the sunrise is just blazingly beautiful. It's brighter than I thought it would be at sunrise. I timed it exactly. The sun is literally just about to be visible on the horizon. And I've just stepped onto the Estacade. And it's kind of surreal. There's this beautiful quilt of clouds with the kind of underbelly of them pink from the sunrise. When I look to the left, I see Pont Champlain. And it's crazy how much traffic there already is. Lots of it leaving the city. Lots of it coming in. And then the Estacade is foot and bike only running in parallel. It's a three kilometer bridge. This is one big, big, beautiful river. And the river, it's interesting here, even though the sun isn't bouncing off it yet, there's kind of a shimmer to the surface because the current here is broken up by all the bridge pillars. So you see like, almost looks like a machine made river surface because it gets kind of broken into a grid of currents. And when I look to my right, so the opposite from the Pont Champlain, I see a lot of smokestacks. I don't know what that industry is over there. One of the questions I said I wanted to explore was how different is the water's surface on the open water side compared to the seaway side. And it's just amazing. So when I look to my right right now, uh, out to the open river, it's like a lake. It actually reminds me of Lake Manitou on a windy day. There's, I wouldn't say there's huge waves, but there's like waves. And then when I look to my left, it's like a glassy pond. There's little ripples because it's wide enough that the wind, it's a windy day, so the wind is kind of picking the surface up a little bit, but it's just another, another world on that side. And then the other thing that's so noticeable, I mean, this is a beautiful path I'm on. Fall leaves, colors are beautiful, but this is a road and on either side are trees and they're all new. So again, Chuck's succession theory had play here. Lots of sumac and poplar. And then the odd larger tree, I, I'm not able to name what kind of tree, but nary a, a tree bigger than me around the middle. And everything else are those trees that kind of show up to break the ground and get the soil going. So it's, it's a little bit surreal in that it's beautiful, but it's sort of sad. Wow, okay, fascinating. So the tail end of my route along the seawall has me turning back from the uh, westernmost point and then doubling back. And the way I planned the route, just looking on the map, it looked like, okay, I can curve along the north side, so the sort of original shore of the river, and then loop up onto the kind of inner track of the seaway and make my way back to the bridge across at around the kind of 24 kilometer mark. So I followed the path. There was actually a little sign to point people towards the camping area. So there's this like urban camping area and it's all very quaint and pretty. Although you hear the rushing river and you hear the Lachine Rapids, which is just amazing. And, uh, and there's like, it's all set up for urban camping. There's a, a cafe closed up now, but, and a like welcome center, all very tranquil. But part of the reason I wanted to come to this part originally was to go all the way into the territory of the seawall that's on Ganawage or Mohawk territory. And then of course, on the very sound advice from our friend Chuck, I did not 
pursue that, but I did want to make it to that border. So there I was following along the path as planned, and then it starts to curve me back towards the bridge I'll cross a couple kilometers back heading east. I was like, well, wait, I haven't gotten to the edge of the territory yet, so I don't want to turn back. So I was like, well, there's got to be a way to get back up onto that inner track and follow it to the edge. And so I sort of bushwhacked a little bit. I think I'm the only person who's bushwhacked on the uh, north wall of the St. Lawrence Seaway in a little while. And it was just a total thicket. And I only needed, I could see where I needed to go. It was like 20 meters in and there's, the land rises up. And that's where I could tell there's a bit of a road because I could see the electrical poles. But I couldn't, well, I made it through the thicket and I got to a fence. It's like, oh crap, I'm not gonna scale this fence. That's a bit nuts. So I doubled back and followed the pretty little camping area, but I kept sort of hugging the inner track, thinking like if it curves towards the road, I'll take it. And sure enough, there was a little crappy path that ducked back up, was kind of blocked off at the top, but just with a cement barrier that was easy to get over. So I hopped over and then I'm on basically an industrial dirt road, which is what I'm on right now. And I was like, oh, okay, now I'm on the road of the seawall or the seaway. So I'm gonna turn right and go until I get to the barrier that'll stop me from going into Mohawk territory. And of course now it's super industrial. I'm like looking at boats that are, I don't know what the cargo is. It kind of looks like sand. Maybe it's the sand they use on the roads. Anyway, big mounds of stuff and big boats doing things and making noises. And I keep going and I'm like, wow, I think I'm going way off course because now I'm just running and running. I wonder how far it is to Mohawk territory. And then I see the sign and it's just a sign. There's no barricade, there's no fence, there's no nothing. I could have run right in, which I didn't realize. And of course I didn't, I stopped. But anyway, it's just fascinating to me how you could come to this part of the seaway and enjoy camping with your family. The trees down there are beautiful. I think that's a lot of the original land. It hasn't been, I mean, it's obviously been disturbed, but there are some huge trees there. So that's like where the shore used to be. It's just beautiful. And you never know that you're right beside this like crazy industrial zone or right on the edge of Mohawk territory. It's kind of surreal. Anyway, there were some beautiful big old trees down there. And then uh, this weird like swimming park with a slide in it that like overlooks the Lachine Rapids, which I thought was kind of ironic because the Lachine Rapids are the whole reason that the seaway was cut. So I'm on the part of the trail that's now once again back on the seaway, but on the south shore of it and abutted by a highway. I should know what highway this is, but I don't. Maybe 15 through Kanziak. And a few things are jumping for me. One is just the name of the town, Kanziak. I remember when I used to spend time around Montreal back in my Mount Aid days. I always thought that Kanziak reminded me of Cardiac. And now here I am running along this artery. And it's, of course, not a coincidence that the road, the human road, runs here alongside the river. And not a coincidence that we decided to make the river more convenient for our transportation. But I'm also using this because I'm on this path, traveling by foot, and I'm just being passed right now by two cyclists going the opposite way. So in Kanjiak, we have this artery, this cardiac system. Even though I don't think Candiac, the name has anything to do with cardiac, that's just my phonetic tinkering. The other thing that struck me, I'm gonna go back actually a few clicks to when I was on the seaway on the north side, still pointed west. And I was thinking about the birds. I, I don't have much to compare it to like from time gone by or from ever having been there before, which I haven't, but there were very few birds until the last little stretch where it widens and where I mentioned it feels a bit more like that was actual shore versus fill that they plopped a road on um, and there I started to see instead of just the occasional seagull I saw a few more birds some starlings a very small flock not enough to like create a murmuration or anything 
And then also some red-winged blackbirds, which surprised me because over by my place, by the old port in the spring, the red-winged blackbirds are so abundant that they're basically a nuisance. And they're really aggressive in the spring when they're mating and nesting. And they literally dive on your head. I've had them like peck the back of my head. I just sort of swat them away. So, and then I kind of forgot about them. I haven't seen them all summer or fall. So I don't know if they just get a little quiet in the old port because they figured out what they needed or if they come this way because there was quite a few out on the seaway. And then again, as it got to that really pretty camping area, um, I noticed that there were a lot more birds, songbirds. I, I wouldn't know the names of them, but at least a couple different kinds of little sort of finch-like or warbler-like songbirds. Now I do realize that even though this is a migratory flyway, I think we're pretty past the winged migration for most of those guys. So maybe a month ago, it would have been more abundant with birds. It might be interesting to check that out. And then coming back here to this artery, just back before I was on this part of the path, there really is just a little strip between the seaway and the highway. Uh, never thought about those words before. Seaway, highway, hmm, why isn't it pavement way? Or ground way. Anyway, just before I was in, kind of in the wilds of Kendiak, a little bit inland from the shore, and it really struck me how the houses were like these pretty little cookie cutter houses, and then some of them were quite uh, sort of luxury. Huh. I may be going to use pejorative terms because I'm judging, but like the sort of faux nouveau luxury, and all these little signs like private drive. Know, maximum speed five kilometers and they're on the shore and of course lakefront or waterfront is always prime but i realized like 50 years ago this was not shore so these are all new waterfront properties and it makes me kind of wonder what was the waterfront property like before and who was there and what happened to them i don't know also lots of sumac lots and lots of sumac so I'm in the wilds of Boisau now, inland, running through the kind of green belt patch that I noticed on the map when I was planning. And I thought, I wonder what goes on there. And now I realize what goes on. Everything is a way. There's the seaway, there's the highway, the roadway, the pavement way, the bikeway. And what is this green belt with all this, these nice soccer pitches and green parks and paths and houses backing onto them where everybody can recreate. Why? It's a hydroway. Hydroelectricity. Great big hydro poles running through here. And so they've sort of taken advantage of the way to also have a nice kind of belt line and a beautiful path. And it's definitely getting used. You know, it's the middle of, well, I don't know what time it is. But it's a weekday and uh, there's people out cycling and walking and walking their dogs so it's a lovely way but it's reminding me of something I learned from the river when I was visualizing this course before I got out here and Eliana guides me sometimes to seek out mentors and one of the mentors she guided me to seek out was around the mentor of commitment and in that seeking, the river actually appeared. Not, I wasn't looking for the river, it was kind of just who showed up. And when I asked the river what gift it brought for me in the context of commitment, the gift was to show that a river is always going somewhere and staying in one place. And it's this paradoxical movement that is permanent. And I know that sort of geologically, it's not really permanent. Rivers change without humans bugging them. They change course, they change depths, they dry up, they carve gorges and canyons, they move over, they meander. So in that sense, maybe permanence is not quite the right word, but they, from our short-term human lifespan and even kind of humans or humanoid lifespan perspective, they more or less stay put but they're always going somewhere. They're always moving. 
and somehow I feel like this way, this electricity passing above, going somewhere, bringing energy somewhere. These cars, these people, these cyclists, me running the river, we're all committed to something. We're all moving, we're all in movement, and we're all more or less staying put in the same breath because we are where we are. And accepting that way, which by definition is a passage from somewhere to somewhere, as a constance feels like the gift of that mentor. And maybe it's an ironic thing that the electrical grid, the sort of modern energy network is explaining it to me on behalf of the river, who's just a little ways off to my left. But that's, I guess sometimes somebody else in the choir has to pipe in to get through. Yes, the religious study student in me does get the joke that the Tao means the way. I'm running through this stretch. Uh, I guess it's still Brassard, maybe. Anyway, just towards the end of the seaway, a little bit before Jacques Cartier and Parc and Jean Drapeau. And I'm empathizing with the little creatures that live in the river that would have experienced the disruption when they made the seaway because I'm trying to make my way along a very clear bike trail at the clear as in I could see it very easily on the route and there's so much construction and detours and I took a wrong turn and I'm like what the heck like at every turn there's these big bulldozers and and other kind like dump trucks and heaps of gravel and the path is suddenly ripped up and all lumpy and uneven and it's like I can proceed and I've been speaking with the construction people as I go like can I go through here like, oh, yeah, yeah, Lizzie. But it's like, geez, it's nuts. I'm like getting tossed and turned in the turbulence that's completely constructed. And I was thinking, what must it have been like to be a, you know, an innocent little, I don't know. I don't even know what kind of fish lived or lived in the St. Lawrence around here when they were cutting the seaway. But whatever they were, to just be going about their business and then all of a sudden, their business got disturbed and it's like you can see the path you can see where you're supposed to be going and you want to go there and then you can go there but like you might get chopped up or like smashed in the face or something and yeah it just feels kind of threatening and scary I don't feel too scared or anything but it was a little like whoa man there's like massive trucks bearing down and just like five meters to my left is the auto route. And, you know, huge traffic bearing along there, lots of noise. So here it is this like pseudo tranquil bike path, but it's like a treacherous gauntlet I'm running here. Anyway, I think I'm more through the worst of it. And I can actually see Parc Jean de la Po and the uh, Pont Jacques Cartier, which is the end of my route. So it's kind of exciting to be <laughs> running past it now. And uh, yeah, maybe this is the most hectic of the river side, because soon I'll cross back over and be right along the river and past the seaway. At least that's my hope, because this is not a pleasant part of the path. It's interesting, and I'm grateful for the conversation. But it's a little bit like going to a heavy metal concert, maybe like a Sepultura concert, because I think Sepultura well, the noise doesn't sound good to me. I know they're trying to say something really important. I'm heading into new territory here, both for my own distance, getting up above 55K now, which I've never done before, um, but also the terrain here. So the seaway ended, or the artificially canalized seaway ended a few kilometers back. Now I'm in the sort of open St. Lawrence, but running alongside some of the river islands. I think on my left that's Ile Charon, and then just up ahead is Ile Beaubois. And on the far shore, so the, I guess the north shore, the Montreal city side, I can see the big 
industrial ports. And it's kind of interesting reflecting on what I see on the river now compared to when I was running over the Escalade at sunrise, which in a way is the sort of, let's say, same river, i.e. it hasn't been overly oriented, at least when I looked west on the Escalade. And then now here, it's back to kind of its more or less natural flow, although you can probably hear the highway because this rather beautiful path is literally uh, like the wall that I could touch with my elbow if I popped it up to the side is the highway. Um, but my other elbow can kind of flap at the shoreline. So it's, I mean, it's a different time of day, so the surface of the water looks different. Plus there's these river islands, so the current feels a lot calmer. It's not so wavy like it was in the big open river on the other side there. Um, but it, it reminds me of a lake, like the river's so wide that it feels to me lake-like. Maybe that's because I'm more of a lake girl, so I recognize lakiness. And then I was also thinking, okay, so this is the not seaway wall. So in theory, it's the more natural shoreline, but clearly this is not the natural shoreline because every single tree is a poplar. Uh, there's a few, no, that's not me. I'm not sure this species, but it seems poplar-esque to me. Some of those kind of early uh, deciduous trees that come after the sumacs. And then there's lots of sumacs. I feel like in a way this run could be called the sumac way because it's all these new young trees trying to break new ground and make something out of it. And the humans are kind of doing that too. Maybe in a way we're, we're just another form of sumac. So I'm back on the stretch where I was, I think two messages ago, doubling back now. And I want to not forget some of what I was thinking about in Boucherville. Boucherville is interesting in relation to the river and then it made me think about all the relationships to the river that I've just moseyed through. The shore of Boucherville hasn't been so radically altered, at least not, not recently, I don't think, and not by humans, maybe by glaciers. Um, you get this feeling of, like, longer settlements, like older houses, basically, and bigger trees and more diverse trees. And then also, I had this feeling of sort of more harmonious relationship with the river. Like you see a lot more evidence of sailing, sailboats and and sailing um, docks and things. And I mean, I suppose you see sailboats anywhere where there's water, sort of. But it kind of felt to me like, and maybe I'm biased because I've chatted with Corinne's husband before about how he grew up. He grew up very near where I just was. And uh, he grew up sailing and windsurfing and basically just being on the river, being with the river. So I thought that was sort of interesting. And then, you know, because of the times these days where real estate in the city is really expensive and or people want more, let's say, comfortable or tranquil or sort of countryside homes or maybe second homes. So they go outside of the city. You can kind of feel that happening with Boucherville and it almost feels generational where you're sort of walking along the street that hugs the shore and you see very by my taste very sort of beautiful not exactly humble but but sort of understated older homes that feel very to my aesthetic very well beautiful and welcoming and not overly um ostentatious and then you feel a generational thing happening where like those folks who had those homes died or their kids took them over or whatever. They got sold, flattened to the ground, and then a new one got built up. And those ones, again, to this person's taste, don't feel like they follow the river. They feel like they follow some idealized sense of what a successful person's house looks like. And yeah, so 
that made me realize that when I was back in Kantiak and uh, uh, where was I? Brassard and running through those new housing subdivisions where everything's really cookie cutter and also probably cheaper. Um, I realized that like you don't even know the rivers nearby. It just doesn't feel, it's sort of like, oh, here's some land, we can put some houses. But yeah, and there's this river. And not surprisingly, those places between the houses and the river, there's a really major highway and the seaway has just been completely cut off. So although there's that new so-called waterfront property that I remarked on, it's like different. It's sort of like, yeah, you can see water if you look out your window, but the relationship doesn't feel the same. I don't know, maybe that's not for me to say. I don't live in either place, so I don't really experience that relationship. But something about going through Boucherville and seeing all the sailboats, not fancy, not, didn't feel like a fancy yacht club. It felt like that was the way people got around and, or just sort of experienced where they lived. 